Take your Bibles, and if you'll make your way to Genesis chapter 22. While you're turning there, let me ask you this question. How many of you guys like tests? Anybody like tests in the room? Like you're just that person? You like tests? I see you in the back. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying there's a challenge there. Like, I, don't, I don't like tests. I didn't like tests growing up. Don't like tests today. And um, I just stumbled upon a video I thought was kind of interesting and funny of a, of a gentleman going around Harvard. Harvard, this sort of epicenter of you know um, um, intelligence and academic excellence you know, to the world. I mean, when you say Harvard, we sort of know what that means, right? And so he's walking around Harvard, and he's asking these Harvard students if they can answer five general questions, just, just general questions about just kind of, they're random things, but just general knowledge, things that aren't too hard. I mean, these aren't things that, you know, are going to blow your mind. We're not talking to a calculus. This isn't, you know, goodwill hunting or anything like that. It's just answer these five questions, and I'll give you $1,000. And here's what the questions are, and I just thought, hey, as, as a church this morning, it's a great time just for some crowd participation. And so we're going to take this test together just to have a little fun. I'm going to ask the question, and if you know the answer, you just blurt it out. And if we get it right, we're going to cheer for ourselves. If we get it wrong, then we're going to cheer for ourselves, okay? And just have a little fun, get the blood moving a little bit, okay? Question number one, what is the largest state by size? Alaska. Let's give it up for Alaska. I love Alaska. How many of you guys have ever been to Alaska? Anybody been to Alaska? It's beautiful. Love it. Question number two, first president to live in the White House. We've not gotten this answer. Adams was the first president. Oh, give yourselves a hand for effort. Okay, John Quincy Adams, we know that. Number three, what is, what is officially the first state? First state. Ooh, Delaware. Somebody said Delaware in the back. Give it up for Delaware. Anybody ever been to Delaware? Anybody been to Delaware recently? Scott Ward just got back from Delaware. Went to pick up a dog. Ask him about it. He'll love to tell you. Number four, which is weird that that's even here, and you went to Delaware last weekend. That's strange. Loudest animal in the world. Humans. Somebody said humans. Some humans would rival the blue whale. The blue whale is the loudest animal in the world, okay? Let's make a blue whale sound if you know it. One, two, three. How did I know you would get that, AJ? All right. Last one. Largest human organ. The skin. Y'all give it up. Every one of us should, should apply for Harvard. Every one of us. Because I was shocked how many Harvard students didn't get a lot of these questions, right? Okay, but test. At the end of the day, that's just a silly way for us to get our minds into this test mentality. Because for the Christian, regardless of what you believe about tests, whether you like them or not, for the Christian, tests are inevitable. And I'm not just talking about academic tests. Those are going to happen too, but really I'm talking about the testing of our faith. We've been reading, right? You're reading for this past week. If you were going to take our reading and you were going to put one word on it, it would be this word, tests. Now listen to this really quick. The testing of our faith is vital to the strengthening of our faith. There's no way your faith is going to grow lest it be tested. We see this in one of our memory verses. If you memorize it, it's in Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. He says, he did not waver in unbelief. This is talking about Abraham. We'll get to that in a minute. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promises, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced what God had promised, he was also able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. The testing of our faith strengthens our faith. And here's what I want us to see this morning. I want us to see two essential things this morning. One, that God uses tests in the life of Abraham to reaffirm that God can be trusted. If you've noticed, in our reading over the last two weeks, we've been neck deep in the life of Abraham. We talked a little bit about this last week as Abraham obeyed God and followed God, and yet what followed that obedience was just uh, an event after an event after an event, showing the point that even when we obey God, life still gets lifey for us sometimes, right? That life is still bumpy. But the bumpiness of life doesn't change the goodness of God and that he is going to keep his promises. So we see that. But we also see in Abraham's life, test after test after test 
after test. Now keep in mind, these tests have a point, and the point is to strengthen his faith and strengthen and reaffirm that he can trust God. We see this in Genesis chapter 12. It all starts there. In Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, Abram, to leave your present, leave where you are now, and I've got a better future for you. Now, that is a strong test for anyone to to hear. Leave the comfort of your life now because we don't know what's going on in his life at this point. We know the people around him are rebelling against God. We see that. But for some reason, he's like, hey, leave what you know. I've got a better future for you. And by the way, that is the pathway of Christianity, that when we put our faith and trust in God, we do leave the comforts of a life, and we exchange that life for a promise of a better life. Even when that life is hard to see, God's promise to us is that the life he has for us is better than the life you would choose for yourself. So we see that in Genesis 12. We see in Genesis 13, uh, his, his courage is tested to do the right thing. We see in Genesis 14, his submission is tested. We see in Genesis 15 that his waiting is tested, that he's, he's waiting on God and his patience is being tested here. What, for what purpose? To strengthen his faith that God is going to come through. In Genesis 17, his obedience is tested. In Genesis 18, his love and compassion and hospitality, they're tested. In Genesis 20, his response to sin and repentance, that is tested. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter 22, which is where we're going to spend our time this morning, the ultimate test for Abraham God comes to Abraham, and he's got something for him. So I want you to, one, this morning see that God uses tests in Abraham's life to reaffirm that God can be trusted. And then the second thing I want us to see is how we should respond when those tests come. Genesis chapter 22, a test shows up in Abraham's life. Starting in verse 1, here's what the text says. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. Now, I want to pause for a second because I really think it's important that we take a little bit of time and we talk about tests. There are two words that you're going to find in the Bible that Christians interact with on a regular basis. One is tests from God and two, temptations. Tests and temptations. They're both biblical. One thing I want you to know about tests that you just got to keep in your mind is that tests, they come from God and they're for your good. How do we know tests come from God? Well, we just read it in Genesis 22, verse 1. God came to Abraham, and he tested him. But then there's this other thing over here, and this other thing is temptation. What is temptation, and how is it different from tests? James chapter 1 helps us with this. It'll be on the screen. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 15 says this. No one undergoing a trial or a test or a temptation should say, I am being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word for test, the word for temptation, there's somewhat of an interchangeable word here, but when it's coming from a tempter, the temptation is a a sort of proof by trial, if you will, that comes from God. That's the test. But then on the other side of it, there is this temptation. And so what we know about God is God doesn't test us for no reason. He has a reason to test us, and he wants to test us to strengthen our faith, but he also wants to show to us that our faith is real and that he can be trusted. And so when God brings a test in your life, not a temptation, we'll talk about that in a second, when God brings a test in your life, He wants to reveal something, not to himself, okay? This isn't the idea that God needs to prove to himself that your faith is real. God knows all things. He knows exactly where you are. But what God does in testing us is he's revealing to us that our faith is real. He's revealing to us that we are truly his children. He's revealing to us that we are truly his child, that we can overcome the sinfulness of this life, that there's something waiting for us. He's showing us that we can trust him, that his promises are going to come true that he's going to keep those promises. And this is what we do as parents all the time. I don't have to convince one parent in this room of how much you love your children. I just just don't. I know that you do. What we do as parents is we spend our time trying to show our children that they can trust that when we say we love them unconditionally, it's true. 
Why do we want that? Why do I want my children to know that when I say to them that I love them, that I mean it? I want to show them at every turn that my love is true and that they can trust me. And the reason I want that to happen and the reason I want you know, uh, their, their lives to sort of echo that, they believe that, is that when life gets lifey for them, I want them to come to me, not the world. When things aren't going their way, I want them to feel like they have a place of unconditional love where they can get guidance and direction. And God gives us children, one, they sanctify us, amen. Children of the great sanctifier, right? The testing of your faith happens on a daily basis when you are a parent, amen. It just does. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's just the way it is. But I want my kids to know. And so I spend my time, trust me, I'm telling you, Trust me. And our kids don't always trust us, do they? No. And so when they don't trust, you know what we say? We have the right to do the I told you so, right? I told you this is what's going to happen. And here's why I knew that's going to happen. Because I did the same thing to my parents, and the result was the same. Trust me. I am not going to lead you down a path to hurt you. This is a relationship fathers have with their children, mothers have with their children. And it's a picture of a relationship that God has with his children. Over and over and over, the tests of this life stand in front of us. They're coming from God and they're for our good to strengthen our faith. And what God is doing is he's showing us, not himself, he's showing us that when we put our faith in him, the things that happen, happen the way he says they're going to happen. His promises are true. And so we have this interaction all the time, tests. Tests are always there to strengthen our faith. But then there's this thing called temptation. Temptation comes from you, and they are not for your good. Temptation comes from you, and it's not for your good. We just read in James chapter 1, go back to it. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And so on the one hand, you've got a test. Tests are always there to show us that we can trust God. But then there is this temptation to sin. And what God does not do, and this is the promise that God makes to us, God does not take something that's sinful, place it in front of you, and say, all right, let's see what you do. That's not what's happening. When you are tempted to sin, it's coming from a nature that we have talked about over and over and over again. Your flesh And so Christians live in the world where we're either going to trust God or we're going to trust our flesh. We're going to let our our faith be strengthened by God or we're going to give ourselves over to our flesh and let it be destroyed. And so that's the balance here. What's going on with Abraham is a test. Go back to Genesis. God comes to test Abraham because he's made promises to Abraham. And now he's got to strengthen his faith because these promises that God has made to Abraham, he's going to need strong faith. Here's Abraham's response. Here I am, he answered. Abraham, here I am. Take your son, he said. Listen to this. Your only son, Isaac. Now, we already know this about Isaac. We saw this last week. We know that God had promised to give him children. We know that God has promised to make this nation. And so then he gives him Isaac, and now he asks for him to take his son, your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. Now notice the breakdown in this text. One, God calls Abraham. Abraham, where are you, right? Abraham says, here I am. And in between that, of his response to God's request, in between the here I am 
and, and him saddling up, here is, here's the, the request. This is the command. Take your son, sacrifice your son. I'm going to take you to this mount. This is in the Jerusalem area. This is, uh, um, um, uh, this is the, the, the area where Jesus is going to be crucified. This is where the temple mount is today. This is where Solomon's going to build the temple. Go to this mount. He doesn't know that yet. Go to this mount, and I want you to sacrifice your only son. His response, based on what we know about the scripture, is that the next day he got up early, he got on his donkey, and he went out in the direction that God told him to go out in. And it brings us to this reality that when God comes to us, whether it be in the form of a test or whether it be in the form of an already known command, regardless, our response, remember the second thing I want us to see is how we respond when these tests come. Our response is always to be obedience. Obedience is always the path to take. It's always the path to take. Obedience to God, regardless of what the world around you is saying, regardless of circumstances, regardless of how hard it may be, and let's just be honest. Can we just be honest for a moment? It is difficult sometimes to obey God. It's difficult. And I know maybe you're sitting in the back going, oh my gosh, you're the pastor? Yes. And it's difficult. Just, you know, be in your house all week with COVID. It's difficult to obey God. It's difficult to drive around and to, you know, get on Rogers Avenue just for any length of time. I mean, there are moments where that flesh is creeping up. And you know what you need to do is right. But you have this flesh, whatever that looks like for you, and however you're wired. I tend to have a little bit of a temper, just to be transparent with you. And I do everything I can to keep that in check, keep that in check, keep that in check. But there are times it's just easier to not keep it in check. There are times it's just easier to not obey. But listen obedience, regardless of how we feel, regardless of how we're wired, obedience to God is always the right path. Never giving into our flesh. And so in a, in a moment of transparency in my own study in the last few days, I've, I've been wrestling with all kinds of different things. I started to ask myself questions. Why, why don't we obey? What, what, what's going on when we know we're supposed to obey God in something, but we don't do it? Why don't we? And I think there's a lot of reasons why. Some of it's just sort of bad teaching, I believe. I think the way you were raised in church really does a, a number on a person's psyche and how they see God and, 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 and even how they see the commands of God in general. For many, they see the commands of God as just boxes to check to ruin your life rather than guardrails to guide your life because that's what they are. They're guardrails. But ultimately, if you're going to boil it down, we don't obey because we don't trust. We don't obey because in a moment or in a season, we've trusted something else. We don't obey because we don't trust God that his way is the path to take. Now, that may not be the commentary of your entire life, but it certainly is the commentary in the moments where we disobey. Because when we disobey, what we're saying is, I don't trust your way, I trust my way. Remember, we're tempted by us. And yes, there are principalities and, 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 and a realm behind all of this that we can't see that's given nudges, right? But at the end of the day, we don't trust, which means we don't obey. We don't obey because we see obedience as a giant undertaking. We look at the notion of being obedient to God. We look at that notion and we see it as this massive, giant undertaking that's impossible for us to accomplish. I'm about to throw this thing. No, I'm not. <laughs> we see obedience as something that there's just no way we could ever, ever accomplish total obedience to God. I'm just going to hold it. And so what do we do with that? We change our view of God, and we remind ourselves as to what we know about God and what he's promised us, that walking with God and obeying God is possible 
because of who God is, not because of who you are. Christianity is not a grip it, white knuckle, I'm going to do better. It's a total release. It's a total giving yourself over to God and trusting him every moment of the way. Andrew Murray said it this way. He said, God is ready to assume full responsibility for a life wholly yielded to him. Did you hear that? God is ready for you to completely lay your life down, and he's going to take full responsibility of you yielding yourself to him completely. He's saying to you, let me take your life, and let me guide you. As the great theologian Carrie Underwood said, Jesus, take the will, right? I hate it when people, I don't know why I do that. I just did it. I'm sorry. We'll delete that later. But that is the point. But here's the cool thing about God. We've already seen last week that God keeps his promises. We've already seen it. And he is ready. He is ready to take full responsibility of guiding your life. And as children, when we lay our lives down, no matter what command is given to us, no matter how difficult it is to obey and to follow, we do it. Why? Because obedience is always the right path. I can tell you something, can I tell you something I've been learning about obedience? Here's what I'm learning about obedience. Obedience happens one day at a time for some. And this is why I think obedience sometimes is, is seen as this big giant uh, undertaking, this impossible task. It's because I think we, we're, we're thinking too far down the road, as opposed to just saying, you know what, today I'm going to obey. Former coach of mine in high school. He says this all the time. Win the day. Just take today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Oh, there's a biblical principle in there, by the way, about worrying. Let's just take today and let's win it. Well, what does winning mean for a Christian? Obedience, holiness, a life yielded to God. And so for some, obedience, and I'm learning this, it's a day by day. But for those of us that are really messed up, it's a minute by minute. It's a moment by moment. It's an hour by hour. Obedience. And I, I think when we tackle obedience that way, day by day, moment by moment, in the moment, in the minute, in the hour, in this particular situation that's being put in front of me, it's a, there's a temptation in front of me, I'm going to obey God. There's a test in front of me, I'm going to obey God. And I'm going to do it day by day. I'm going to do it minute by minute. I'm going to do it hour by hour. And listen to me. When we disobey, which is inevitable too, when we do, in those moment by moments, day by days, hours by hours, pursuing and chasing after what we know to be right, taking the path of obedience, here is the beautiful thing. We learned this last week. God promised Abram, I'm going to do both for you. You can't be perfect. And listen, it's okay to say that in this place. No one is perfect. Look at the person next to you and say, you are far from perfect. Go. Some of you need to hear that. But that truth is not a license to be unholy. That truth is not a license to be disobedient. That truth is there to remind you that when the inevitability of your flesh shows up, you know what we have? The promise of God. Grace. That he's done the work for us. And what that should do is embolden us, embolden us to live a righteous life and to pursue holiness and to obey God in grace. And even our response to sin is a step of obedience or disobedience. When you sin, if you run from God, you're being disobedient to God. If you sin and you repent and you call upon the name of the Lord, that is a response of obedience. So even your response to sin says something about your obedience or disobedience. And so obeying God is the right path. And it can seem like this massive undertaking. But if we'll just take a step back, if we'll take a big deep breath as we battle our sin in this broken, fallen world and take our obedience one moment at a time, be in the moment, not in the next day or the next day, but one day at a time, when the day. Now listen, every call to obedience from God in your life, 
Every call to obedience from God is as important to your spiritual life as it was for Abraham. Now think about that for a second. Abraham has to obey God, and he's obeying God, and God has made a promise to him that's going to echo in even today to 2022. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so his obedience is, is vital in many ways. But for us, when we look at this story, yes, this story is about Abraham, and yes, this is about the ushering in of the Messiah and salvation, and there's no Jew, Gentile, I mean, all that is true. But it's also a reminder for us that when God asks us to obey, it's just as vital for us. And so we don't look at God's commands on our life and we sort of level them. We just see that everything God calls us to do is as significant for our spiritual life as this moment was for Abraham. Sacrifice your son. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up. So he's traveling about 50 miles. And so as he's traveling on this third day, he looks up and he saw, he sees this place in a distance, Mount Moriah. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and, the boy and I will go over there to worship. First time we see worship in the Bible, by the way. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham, and he said, My father? He replied, Here I am, son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb of the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Now, let me give you a little insight here because there's a lot of foreshadowing going on here. His father is walking him up to this mount, and he's going to sacrifice him. But Isaac, more than likely, is an adult. Isaac is probably around 30 years old at this time. And so because of that, he's doing this willingly. His dad is like 130, I think, at this time. And so he could willingly, when it gets to that point, when he says, oh, my goodness, where in the world is the, where is it? Why are you tying my feet? What's going on, Dad? But he willingly takes this wood, and the description is that he places the wood for the offering onto Isaac. All this foreshadowing of Jesus and Calvary and the sacrifice that he's going to offer. And here's the cool thing, because the promise here, God's going to provide the sacrifice. And here's the cool thing. We know this now. God does provide the sacrifice. Amen? It's himself, the perfect lamb. And so you have this, this conversation taking place. And it seems as though when you read it, it seems the narrative is sort of calm given the circumstances. Isaac willingly lays down. He allows himself to be bound, whatever that looked like. And then now he looks up and his father, who loves him, is going to sacrifice him. On the other side of obedience, remember, number one, obedience is always the right path. But on the other side of obedience, there is a promise. And so while, yes, obeying God seems like this massive undertaking at times, the way we position ourselves to obey is we're reminded of what God promises us when we obey. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said in verse 12, don't lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration. 
because you have done this and you have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates for their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. What is on the other side of obedience is a promise, and that promise is blessing. That's the promise that God gives to us. He says, when you obey, blessing follows. Now, don't take this in some prosperity, health, and wealth. I don't know what the, 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 the specific blessing in your life is, but here's what I know of some big things that happen. When we, are, when we obey, we're at peace in our heart and mind. You know, when you disobey God, if you're a follower of God, turmoil builds up in your life, anxiety and frustration and weariness. You get exhausted because you know you're not doing what you need to do. That certainly defines my life. And so when I obey, the the blessing of peace is on me. When I obey, that I know that harmony exists in my soul and in my relationship with God. And so when I walk with him and talk with him, it's sweeter, it's more focused, it's more intentional. That's the blessing that we have when we obey God. But here is the real big picture. The real big picture is is that obedience to God, meaning we trust God and his promises, because that is the story of Abraham here, that when we trust God and his promises... Here's the blessing that he just tells Abraham once again that he's going to pour out onto all people who are blessed by him. Through his obedience, the nations are going to develop. Jesus is in that line. Jesus is going to be born. He's going to live the life. He's going to provide the way. He's going to be the perfect lamb. He's going to go, and the Lord is going to provide for us on that mountain through the life, the death, the burial of Jesus. That's what this story is getting us to. And here's what the blessing is when we obey. When we obey God, God and we trust God. In this particular case, Abraham is trusting that God is telling him the right thing. Kill your son. We're going to see later the reason he does it is he trusts that God can bring back the dead. So whatever God's telling him to do, he's not going to remove his son because he's made a promise. And so Abraham goes through with it. And then God provides that lamb. For us, our obedience is, it starts here, our obedience is trusting That Jesus' life, death, and burial, and resurrection is enough to make me right before God. And when I obey God in obedience by submitting my life to him, the blessing is the blessing of righteousness. That's what's given to you when you obey God is the blessing of righteousness. Meaning what? That right now I stand before God rightly. Why? Because he made a way for me to be right with him. And that way was not my life. If it were up to me, I couldn't stand and say that every moment of the day. But because of what Jesus has done, I have been made righteous because of his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what obedience to God promises you. It's what it promises me. Obedience to God promises a blessing, a blessing of holiness as well. And this is where grace comes in. Not only am I right before God because I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb, now I get to walk through the inevitability of a broken world with a nature that's battling at this new nature that's been given to me. In the midst of all of that, I can live a holy life. I can be obedient to God and battle my flesh I can war it now. I have the tools that I need to battle this thing that wages inside of me, the flesh, sin. And when the tempter comes, I can fight. I can battle. What's my tool? Righteousness. What's my weapon? Grace. I can live a holy life. That's a blessing that God provides for us. And then not only do we have the blessing of righteousness, not only do we have the blessing of holiness, We have the blessing of eternity with Jesus. We have the blessing of eternity with Jesus. That one day, this is all over, and every moment of obedience in your life is worth it. 
No Christian's going to end their, get towards the end of their life and that they have the ability just to say a few nuggets of wisdom. No one is ever going to say, man, I wish I would have disobeyed more. It's always going to be, yeah, I wish I would have obeyed more. I wish I would have gotten saved earlier. I wish I would have listened to that when I heard it the first time. I wish I didn't have to learn it this way. I wish I would have walked with God more. And here's the cool thing. The cool thing is, is that we can navigate this life as we head towards eternity, and we can do it in grace, we can do it in mercy, we can do it in righteousness, and we can go all in when it comes to pursuing a holy life because that's the promise that's given to us when we obey righteousness, holiness, eternity. And so here's the natural question as we conclude here. What is it in your life right now that you need to obey? What's the command in your life that you know you're being disobedient to? And you'd say, hey, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. What's the test that's in front of you? You know that something is in front of you and you've got paths to take and you've got decisions to make. Which decision are you gonna make? Is it a decision to obey God and trust God or is it the decision to obey your flesh and trust yourself? Well, this morning, if you've walked in wondering what to do, Obedience is always the right path. Choose the path of obedience in your life. If it's as specific as a disobedience to a command, like you know that what's going on in your life shouldn't be happening, what you do today is you stand on grace and you respond as if grace has covered you. And here's how we respond. We repent. We, we call out to the Lord this sin that's in your life. And you repent. You ask God to restore to you the joy of following him and obeying him. You call sin what it is. It's sin. And you repent of it. And you turn away from it. And you move towards God. Because God is ready and willing to take full responsibility of a life fully yielded to him, Andrew Murray. And so for you this morning, your response may be just as simple as that is to repent this morning, to call out sin in your life, and to leave here today moving in a different direction. But here's what I know. I know this, that when it comes to walking with God in this life, Christians are not meant to do this alone. Some of you might be struggling with a sin. There's something in your life you're being disobedient in, and man, it's just gripped you. Because remember, Christians are not exempt from the curse of a broken world. Life gets lifey for all of us. I know that Christians need one another, and so maybe for you this morning, there's just something going on in your life, and you just need somebody to talk to. You just need to sit down. You need another brother or sister in Christ to get around you and to walk with you. Listen, I can't implore you enough. Take advantage of that when we put it in front of you because we want to do that. It's why we do what we do. There are people in this church that love other people and want to see Christians walking with God in obedience and victory, not living in turmoil and bound by the chains of sin. And so for you this morning, you just need help. That's all you need to put on that Connect With Us card. You take that Connect With Us card, you write on the back, I I need help. And we'll call you and we'll begin to walk with you and come alongside of you and be the church together. But your response in the immediate is to repent. Call it out this morning. Ask God for forgiveness, and he promises that he'll give it to you, and then walk in grace as you pursue him in righteousness and wholeness. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. Listen, your response is to take the first step of obedience, and that is to believe God. The Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth, you believe um, um, in your heart that that Jesus died and that God rose him from the, the dead, that he's alive now, that his life, death, burial, and resurrection was for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you'll call out to God in belief that all that is true and give your life to Christ, submit yourself to the rule and reign of God, the Bible says you'll be saved. And so this morning, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've never called out the name of the Lord for salvation, I want to invite you to do that this morning. And you can do that one of several ways. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to respond by worshiping. Don will come up, give us some parting words, and then we'll be dismissed. You can, right after the end of this service, if you'd like to talk to somebody about putting your faith and trust in Jesus, you just come right over here. I'll be hanging around down front. I'd love to talk to you about salvation today.
Or at the very least, you can take one of those red Connect With Us cards. You can write on the, the front of it your information. And on the back, you can just say, hey, I need, a pa- I need a pastor to call me. I'll call you. We'll set up a time, and we'll talk about salvation. But let me encourage you, while you can fill out that card, I'm going to ask you, if that's you and you know and you're ready to talk, you do that today. You don't have to wait. Today, you can ask questions. And today, you can put your faith and trust in Jesus. And you can walk out of here right before God, living a, towards a holy life, and holding on to the promise of eternity that whenever it ends for you, you get to spend eternity with Jesus. Not because you're awesome, but because he is awesome. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we think about our obedience, as we see the difference between a test and temptation and where they come from and what they're for, God, one, we're thankful for the tests that come our way, as difficult as they are, because they do strengthen our faith, that no matter what is in front of us, if we know it's from you and it doesn't contradict your word, then we do it and we can trust that doing that's always the right way. And on the other side of that obedience is a blessing, righteousness, holiness, eternity, inner peace, confidence that we can enter into your presence no matter what because of Jesus. And so what I pray today for Christians that are thinking about their obedience and the sin in their life, and today they'll just be encouraged by the very fact that they can repent and you in grace like the father of the prodigal son, embrace us with grace. We are never, ever separated from you. And so what I pray that today, for those that need more help, for those that just need some people to talk to, uh, somebody to help them, Lord, I pray that they'll be bold enough and the courage in their hearts will be there to take a step out, to reach out to another brother in Christ, another sister in Christ. For those that have never put their faith and trust in you, Lord, I pray today that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the calling of the Holy Spirit, that they'll do that today, whether they're at home listening or whether they're right here live with us, that today will be the day of salvation. Today will be the first step of obedience by submitting to you. I pray that for any person that would would define them. And that in just a moment we dismiss that God, just your spirit will give them boldness to come and talk to make the most important decision they'll ever make, and that's what they believe about Jesus. So, Father, we do worship you. We do thank you. We are thankful for grace, that even in our disobedience, you you put grace on us, and the grace allows us to, to, to repent and to turn to you with open arms and to live a holy life moment by moment, day by day. God, we love you. We thank you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?